Release the full weight of the body to the earth. Now come around with an essential oil mist as you settle into Savasana so that you can enjoy this. <laughs> this pose will activate your inner goddess. Let's breathe in, pull the body. This pose relieves back pain. After several frustrating experiences like these as a student in yoga classes, I was inspired to take action from my perspective as a trauma therapist and writer. In 2015, Elephant Journal published my article, An Open Letter from a Trauma Therapist to Yoga Teachers, 12 Simple Ways to Make Your Classes More Trauma-Informed. In this video, my collaborator Jessica Sowers and I are happy to discuss the principles of the article and hope to give you an even deeper study guide into what we have learned. I like adjustments. You like adjustments typically. I love adjustments, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I knew this was going to be the style of yoga class where you got adjusted. Yeah. Yet, I had such a horrible experience with an adjustment being so invasive. Mm -hmm. Literally, the teacher's hand was in my butt crack during a warrior one or two adjustment. And even as somebody who is pretty used to speaking up and as somebody who likes adjustments, I felt that I froze. Mm -hmm. It was the yeah. sense of, I can't speak up. Do you ever have that happen? I'm yeah. curious. On occasion. Yeah. I usually go the opposite way where then I over speak. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So hypo, hyper arousal, which is two, two manifestations of potentially being triggered. And I think an, another thing that startled me was I felt I couldn't speak up to this instructor afterwards. Yeah. It really was this sense of shutdown. I did mention something to the studio host, yet it felt like I got the comment that I get a lot, which is you worry too much about trauma. Ah, uh, you worry too much, too about, much trauma. about trauma. So point one in my open letter, there are 12 points here, is that being trauma informed, if we're using the general terminology here, is for everybody. Because mm -hmm. uh, something I hear a lot is, well, we're not really dealing with recovering people here. or We're not really dealing with mental health people here. You're a studio owner. What do you have to say about oh, that? Oh, I disagree strongly. <laughs> I think that if you are teaching a class, there, it, it, I don't, it doesn't matter what population or where you are located. If you're teaching a class and you have more than one person in there, you, you, you're more more than likely going to have someone who has suffered trauma. Right. Because if you look at conservative statistics, and my viewpoint on statistics is they're low ball mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't disclose due to stigma. Right. And it's something like one in three women have had an experience with being sexually assaulted in some way or mm -hmm. sexually abused in some way. And if you're in a yoga studio, whether that be in the suburbs or in the city, mm -hmm. if one in three is your odds in the general public, likely somebody is going to be walking into your class. Right. And there's so much press now about yoga is good for you, which it can it be, is, yeah. it is. Yet many people I feel don't give it the chance it deserves for them because they've walked into a class that isn't either a good fit for them or they have an experience like that getting such an aggressive adjustment where they may feel re-traumatized all over again. Right. Right. I That's can... kind of redundant, re-traumatized all over again. You get my point. <laughs> so the second point is if even one new student, one new person comes to a class that you're teaching or facilitating, it's imperative that you review the protocol for safe practice. So what are some of the things you like to cover in an opening? of that nature. Well, first of all, I think you need to have a protocol for safe practice. Um, I Good don't point. think that that's always <laughs> out there. So I think that Let's you not have assume, to assume right? that right. people have that. <laughs> so first of all, I think you need to have something in place. And not only do you have to have something in place, if you are a studio owner, you need to ensure that your instructors have something in place. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a few components of that are going to be about offering information to individuals who are coming into yoga maybe for the first time or new to your studio or new to your class making sure that um, you check in with them. Mm -hmm. I also think it's important to cover a little bit of a background about what an edge may feel like because we tend to use mm -hmm. that word your physical edge but mm -hmm. many newbies may look up like what's an edge mm -hmm. and so I've always found some kind of orientation about it's okay to challenge yourself yet to recognize and you may do a lot of this facilitating throughout the class mm -hmm. but I do feel that kind of getting that out there up front that this is not competition it's not about mm -hmm. forcing yourself but that is another 
way to, to stay safe. And the reason I mentioned if even one new person comes is we can tend to get in a rhythm when our regulars come who kind of yes. know how we operate that, yeah, any questions, good, we're good to go. Yeah. But if even one new person comes, it's like we say often in 12 step groups, if even one new person comes to the meeting, you start with step one. It also is a great practice because it gives a reminder to those who are in class. Mm -hmm. um, so many times, you know, we, we get into that routine. We know our students as they're our regulars, they know us, but each day is different for everybody. And what one person might enjoy on a regular basis, maybe today they had a rough day and they don't want a hands-on adjustment. Mm -hmm. So allowing them to have that perspective and permission that they're allowed to say no at any point in time. And then they're allowed to say yes again in the future. So first of all, I like to create an environment where someone is not a spectacle or the mm. center of attention. So I know in my classes, if um, I have a new person in there and or they're not my regulars, um, usually towards the beginning of class, maybe when the eyes are invited to be closed or when we come into our first child's pose or forward fold, mm -hmm. so people aren't looking around and can see everyone, um, at that point is usually when I say that I come around and do hands-on adjustments. And if you would like to not have this done, you are allowed to say no. And if that's your choice, to please raise your hand now. And then typically whether I get somebody raise their hand or not, I pause for just a couple breaths so that anybody who's on the fence and doesn't know, they have a moment to make up their mind. Um, they can raise their hand and then I always thank them mm -hmm. and then move on with the class. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of studios will do the method of having a card or a, like a, if you've ever been to a Brazilian steakhouse, like the stop and go, the, <laughs> the red side and uh, green side, that could potentially be mm -hmm. something that, that is useful with adjustments. And mm -hmm. I know this may not feel elegant in every class, but I've been in classes with you before where you've come up and, and it, there has been a breath to just kind of double check. Would you like adjusted yeah just very softly gently yeah and, and it's like yeah go for it or Absolutely. you know no don't stay connected to that breath nice deep inhales and exhales as we sink in Jamie is it okay if I adjust your hips sure all right I'm going to come to stand right behind you my hands will be placed on your sacrum take a deep breath in and on the exhale, we'll bring the hips back and down. Nice deep breath in. How is this, more or not enough? Feels good. Good. So that, if it works for your style, may also be a nice verification. Mm -hmm. I also like to, um, which which can be a little more challenging for individuals, but if you are if you can read the energy level of, of your students mm -hmm. and kind of feel into that, if you have someone who's in a posture and as you're walking around facilitating your class and you can feel their energy pull in and they become really tense the closer you get, you're definitely not going to put your hands on that person to give them an adjustment. Mm -hmm. You're going to just breathe and mm -hmm. keep walking. Um, maybe give verbal cues if they need some alignment or adjustments. You're going to give those verbal cues. So number five, offer some kind of protocol as well for opting out of using essential oils. So tell me a little bit about the thought of bringing essential oil use into yoga classes. Mm -hmm. So essential oils, um, especially lately, it's the new buzz thing actually mm -hmm. right now um, with essential oils. So they're utilized in class to just enhance the experience of a yoga class. There are different ways that that can be done. It can be done simply by diffusing the oil um, into the environment. It can be used by applying oil to the skin of the student. It can be either they're applying it to their skin or the instructor's applying it to their skin. Maybe you walk around as an instructor with a mist bottle of essential oil and distilled water. Whatever it is, there are many different ways to enhance the experience of the class. So again, like with physical adjustments, we have to respect that just because we may like to be sprayed or we may like lavender or any mm -hmm. other essential oil, not every student will like it. So okay. when you offer the hands-on adjustment uh, <laughs> opt-out at the beginning, you can also work in 
the essential oil line there as mm -hmm. well or you can ask as you go around mm -hmm. uh, like Jessica said a lot of it depends on how you are using them mm -hmm. to uh, make a way for offering that off. if I'm diffusing the oils I usually start that diffusing before class starts before anyone gets here so that the scent is already in the air um, and then I usually turn it off right when people start to arrive um, so that it's not overpowering to anyone because no matter where I set the diffuser someone is close to it mm -hmm. so I like to think ahead and, and do it that way um, also that then from that point forward, I usually use a few different essential oils throughout class. So I ask each time I'm going to use the essential oil. Sometimes I'm, I'm going to physically apply it to my students. So then I always give them the option mm -hmm. to not have the oil. If they were a no touch person, I'm already not applying the oil mm -hmm. to them. Um, but I also, when I ask, I share which essential oil it is because mm -hmm. I want to ensure no one has an allergy. Right. Um, so I let them know and I let them know where I'm going to place it. So maybe I'm using a balance essential oil and I'd like to place it on the back of the neck when they're in child's pose. So I tell them exactly what I'm going to do and then ask them if they would like to not have this, just raise your hand. And they're already usually in that child's pose. Um, another thing is I like to do is I like to use the nice little spritz um, mm -hmm. when they're in Savasana mm -hmm. to just help them to calm in and, and settle into Savasana. So um, as they're settling in, as they're settling in, I don't wait until they're already settled. Right. Um, but as they're settling in for Savasana, I will tell them that I'm going to come around with this you know clary sage essential oil mist and i'll just spritz it over your body as you rest and if you would not like this to simply raise your hand so the key there is don't spray them like a cat on a counter <laughs> when you're already no. rested and blissed out no, and I make sure that the spritzer that I have on the bottle is a nice fine mist. And when they're lying on the floor in Savasana, I'm standing and I usually lift my arm all the way up and yeah. spritz a couple spritz. So by the time it reaches them, if they feel any moisture at all, it's going to be very little. They just want I just want them to have the the smell experience. So the next point here making yourself available after class. I do want to acknowledge up front this is not about making yourself available to offer individual therapy. We're not expecting you to spend an inordinate amount of time with folks who may want to jeopardize your time after class. And we also want to recognize that sometimes the schedules can get really packed like one class goes into another, but wherever possible, try to make yourself available for questions or comments of a more private nature after class. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that I handle this too, because I'm not a therapist, so I definitely don't want to get um, pulled into that situation where maybe they're looking for input or advice. I, that is not my place to give. So um, as a studio owner and as a yoga instructor, I like to have a resource list available. So I actually have a little list of people that I can refer them to for many different reasons. Um, and have that tool for them to, to give out. Also, I am always available after class, but it is usually for a short amount of time because the next class is coming in. So when I'm talking to them or when they have some um, time and they're, they're expressing things, I let them know right up front, I have about three minutes to nice. chat. And that way they know that they're under time constraints so they can get to the point really. Mm -hmm. Um, and tell me what's going on. And then I can decide whether it's something that I need to help them with um, or whether I need to make a referral for them. Right, and the key is not to leave people hanging. Yes. Um, to let people know that it, it's okay if you have a question because mm -hmm. so many people feel not just that they can't say no, but that they're not allowed to ask questions. Oh. This one may be stepping on some toes depending on what yoga tradition you come from because I've studied at certain yoga schools and with teachers from certain lineages where I've heard things like closing the eyes immediately reduces stress by so much or promotes relaxation and the reality is that intention may be good but if a person struggles with things like claustrophobia or if they had ever been abused in the dark the closing of the eyes is not always optimal so I've always liked when yoga teachers give me the option of closing the eyes or soft gaze mm -hmm. because so many of these breaths and postures work just as well with the soft gaze right and that may actually help you relax or rest even deeper if you're not feeling so threatened right 
And I think the thought process of the eyes being closed can help to decrease stress and drop you in. I believe that that's the case. However, I feel that that's the case after lots and lots of practice. Mm. So if you have things that still come up for you when you do close your eyes, absolutely not. That's not going to work for your body or your mind. But maybe as you continue and you work through these things, and you start to um, have some um, tools and mechanisms in place and you're letting go of some of the things, then maybe that experience is good. But always as a yoga instructor, it's just like making modifications on postures. Not every body does a posture the same way. Not every body is going to feel the same way about the eyes opened or closed. So giving them options is gonna do nothing but to empower them to make a choice for themselves to own their own experience, which is exactly what we're offer, and to tune in to what is truly best in their body. So guided imagery, a lot of yoga teachers like to bring it into their shavasana or other parts of practice. As a therapist, I obviously have some strong opinions about guided imagery. I have a love-hate relationship with it in that some are awesome. I think some are very mindful and do help a person enhance their experience. Yet a lot of folks, therapists, yoga teachers alike, read a cool guided imagery in a book and think, I want to share that with my class and don't consider how it may be potentially triggering. So my big caution is to, in general, avoid the ones that involve going to places or bringing in other people. Like to me, a good example of a guided imagery that would be more trauma informed or trauma focused is like imagining the balloon when you're doing breathing. That might be a good one or imagining a light field or an energy field, a color field, because it is fundamentally about keeping the person in the here and now of this room. Uh, I steer away from from place-based ones or people-based ones if I don't know who I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. So again, for yoga teachers or yoga facilitators in, in a clinical type setting, if you know the person and you know that they have some experience with imagery, uh, with realizing you know this isn't real, but it is something I'm using my imagination for, then I would say you maybe can be a little more daring with using it. But if it's with a group of newcomers, avoid things like the safe place, the happy place, the calm place, because it's there's just too many unpredictabilities that may surface. So just because a pose makes you feel a certain way, don't assume it makes others feel that way. So Jessica and I go back and forth in this one all the time because I love child's pose. She can't stand it. She loves downward dog. I can't stand it. And we do have similar-ish body types. So just because a pose makes you feel a certain way. I've heard teachers say things like, this pose radiates joy and this pose feels yummy and delicious in the sacrum. That is telling people fundamentally what they should be feeling and don't just don't assume mm -hmm. that because it makes you feel, I'll let you pick up mm -hmm. on that. Because that's my uh, core message. Well, one of the things, too, if you tell someone how to feel and they're not having that experience, mm. they feel like they're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really mindful. What you can say instead is this posture has been known uh -huh. to release the sacrum and feel really soothing. This posture has been known to do this. Or in my experience, in my body, this posture feels this way. But not relating that outward so that people can feel like they're failing if they don't feel that same emotion or feeling in the body. Right. So I like to allow people, because we do want them to close in and really connect to the body and how it does feel. So I really like, instead of telling people what the experience is, I like to ask them. Right. So if I want them to really engage that front quad in a warrior two position, and instead of saying, you should feel very strong in your front quad, instead I might ask, how is your front quad feeling? Right. And what would you do to make it feel stronger? I've heard teachers do this with physical benefit. I've heard teachers do it with mental health benefits too. Like mm -hmm. this pose alleviates depression. This pose will help your anxiety. That simple switch up in the language. This pose has been known to alleviate depression or this pose may be beneficial for anxiety. Because first of all, if you're telling people that things will do stuff with mental health benefits, you're automatically, in my opinion, outside of your scope of practice. Uh huh. And you could open yourself up there to like, well, she's giving me medical. Mm -hmm. Like if I do this, then this will happen. Right. 
So it's, it's well known that a lot of these poses may be beneficial for certain things, but even wording it that way will take the shame away if people don't feel like it's happening for them instantly. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also think that even that language about the benefits of it, it, it it's not when you do that posture one time. Right. So if that individual is taking that it's posture not? one time, they're not going to be cured. Yoga's not it's a cure, <laughs> an instant quick fix. It's this process. It's the practice and bringing that in and embracing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and then discovering the benefits they kind of sneak up on you they don't smack you mm. and say hey you're fixed right now on the first try <laughs> so it's really important to understand that when sure. we're communicating and my other big soapbox one is please 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 don't p tell people you are in a safe place students you're in a safe place with me Show them that, don't tell them that. Because so many trauma survivors coming to a yoga class are still trying to figure mm. out if they feel safe or safe enough in your place. And that's fundamentally their call. Mm -hmm. And if they hear you say something like, this is a safe place, your intention may be good to tell them that that's your intent, but it's still fundamentally telling people how they should feel. So making a few statements about non-competitiveness during class. I always like to intone the example one of my early teachers set for me. She would just insert this great line here and there. Touching your toes does not make you a better person. Because I think so many students coming into classes think the pose has to look a certain way in order for them to be doing it right. Mm -hmm. And competitiveness and striving can become an issue. Tell us what you've yeah. seen in your classes. Well, and there, there are two forms of it too. It's either outwardly looking around the class to see how everybody else is doing it and then judging yourself to say, oh my gosh, I can't do it like that and not realizing that maybe those individuals in the class have been coming for 14 years. Mm -hmm. So so that's the first thing is judging yourself based on others. Mm -hmm. The other piece of that competitiveness is self-competition. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was 12, I used to be able to do this and now that I'm 45, I can't, shame on me. Or even last week I did it. Yeah. And why can't I do it today? Exactly. I'm a loser. So really taking that piece out. I like to say in my classes um, a couple of things. The one thing is that it, yoga is not a team sport. Mm -hmm. It's not about everybody working together and enhancing their practice to come together um, while that could be a benefit energetically it's definitely not on your mat your mat is your mat it's yours it's for you and your body to experience the posture in your own way in your own time and allow it to unfold as it will avoid overtly praising your students who, because let's face it, you can be human, you may have favorite students, you may have students who are endearing to you because you've seen them really progress. There's a lot of reasons our attention may draw mm -hmm. to one student. And you really do want to avoid overtly praising your favorite students. Like I have seen, especially workshop instructors, kind of pick the person with obviously the most nimble asana practice, demo everything. Yeah. or. And I remember one of my friends was that at a workshop once and she goes, I felt like I was the show pony. So even the, the favorite student or so to speak that the attention's being drawn to, um, that could be unfair to them and you can be inadvertently fostering this competitiveness. It's mm -hmm. like, well, why doesn't she pick me to demo stuff and why doesn't she call me out by name mm -hmm. and all of this? So, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I don't think I ever pick a favorites. Um, I do walk around and say, hey, good job. Yeah. Nice try. Do that. Um, but I, I, if I do that to one person, I ensure that right. I don't do it to them again that class, yeah. that I walk around and share that praise. Mm -hmm. um, and always at the end of class, because I make myself available to students anyways, mm -hmm. always at the end of class, I ask every single person, unless they've ran out the door really quickly, I always ask them how they're feeling. Um, and I tell them that they did a great job today and just thank them for coming in because it's a big commitment just to walk through the doors. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think the, the thank you for showing up, um, a, a point, a story I tell in the original article I wrote was one time I was at an advanced flow class that was definitely over my, what I felt was over my level, level acrobatically or asana wise, but I've always been one who's been up to the challenge if the class is offered, knowing I could opt out or modify or really use my breath. And it was interesting that the teacher of the class drew attention to how good my breath breath was flowing. And I just remembered, you know, it's not competitive yet that made me feel like she noticed that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something you can always notice in a class, right. especially if you teach more vigorous level classes where we can get into this 
mindset about how they doing the whole flow or how are their what how what kind of challenging postures are they doing right how's the breath and that's something yeah. that your students who may consider themselves more beginner may actually be paying more attention to right and and that's a very good point too because yoga means to yoke to unite mm -hmm. and it's about uniting breath and movement right so if you're straining 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 are you doing yoga to the best of your ability